not play on emotion. Understandably, how can we sit here and do nothing when every day X number of people get sick and X number of people die? That's a very strong reason to push on the empiric approach. So it wasn't as if I was against that empiric approach, but the scientific data that justified it, I was starting to realize, and my colleagues, boy, this is really weak. So when I looked at a limited amount of resources, I said to myself, if they want to go ahead with the study, fine, but I just can't see putting scarce resources into an empiric approach with virtually no good data that it might work, as opposed to trying to discover a bit more that might inform better the next empiric step. Now, it was very interesting historically because when I made that decision, I made the announcement, the press was there, there were cameras and everything. That was exactly the day that the very famous O.J. Simpson was taking his ride on the Santa Monica freeway uh, after uh, the uh, 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 event that led uh, to the publicity and the trial that lasted for so long. So there was absolutely no what I thought was going to be a big explosion of publicity that, you know, Fauci blocks vaccine trial. It made it into the scientific literature, science and nature and others, but it made a very, very, very little s snippet in the lay press, mostly because everything was O.J. Simpson. collaboration between the Thai government, the Department of Defense, and ourselves who took over some of the um, uh, responsibility in a shared way with the Department of Defense. From a pure scientific standpoint, uh, it was a bit different than just the plain old envelope. It was a, it was, it was a variety of other uh, uh, approaches that were being tested. I think the scientific data was a little bit stronger, but not necessarily uh, strong enough right now to say, gee, I feel comfortable about this. There were other aspects that went into it. In, in, in a perfect world, uh, if there were not commitments that had been made to other nations and to other agencies, the decision may have been a little bit different. At the same time, there was a push driven by the historic success of empiric approaches and the compelling need in certain countries for a vaccine. It's critical to understand that. This is not something that's black and white. So we're moving along here learning things. You have a country that says, my country's being devastated. You people promised that you would help us with this vaccine. We know the, the chances might be slight, but slight is better than nothing. People are dying, people are getting sick. That's not politics. That's a balance of a decision of how much weight you're going to put on in period. Now, as we went along, as the trial got started and went along, we were learning more and more and more and saying, wow, you know, the chances of that trial being successful are really, really even smaller than we thought. Because the more we learn about this virus, we more than we realize that with all due respect to the historic success of empiric approaches, Everything we learn about that virus tells us that, you know, God bless empiricism, but it doesn't look like this is going to work. We didn't have all that information when the decision was made to go ahead. Would I have done a trial like that in the United States? No way, because the, the infection rate in the United States and the prevalence of the incidence is significantly lower than what it was at the time in Thailand. I see myself as a politician. I see myself as an honest broker for science, and that's the reason why I think I've done well, if I might say, and, and, and been able to be effective. When you advise presidents, you've got to be prepared to go in there and tell them something that they don't want to hear. People get in trouble who are politicians uh, when they tend to tell people things they want to hear who are in power. So every time I go to the White House, and I've done this many, 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 many times over the last 28 years. Every time I go to the White House, 
will go down to the Congress. I tell people exactly what it is I think is true that's based on the science and the public health. To, to say we don't know we're going to have a vaccine, nobody's interested in that. That sounds sort of very vague. The press likes to hear either we'll never have a vaccine, that's news, or we're going to have a vaccine in one or two years, that's news. But hey, I don't have any idea when we're going to have a vaccine. That's really not news. So when people ask me, I give them non-news. So let me give you non-news. I don't have a clue, A, when we'll have a vaccine that's effective, or B, if we will even ever have a vaccine that's effective. Now, when I say that latter, people go, oh my God, the man who's responsible for all of the funding for vaccine, not all, but a substantial part of it, he says he's not sure of whether or not we're gonna have a vaccine. And let me tell you why I can, with some degree of comfort, say that. Because as I have said many times, unlike other vaccine endeavors, the HIV vaccine situation is still in the stage of discovery. We still don't know how and why and if and when a body makes a robust neutralizing antibody and T-cell response that could both block acquisition and, pre and, and prevent the spread of progression. The reason we don't know why, because the body doesn't do it in natural infection. So whenever you're in the discovery phase, discovery is haphazard, sometimes blind alleys, sometimes eureka moments, completely unpredictable. And even though I'm cautiously optimistic, I don't know if we'll ever have one in the classic sense of being 95% protective of people. I don't know when and how that's gonna happen. Am I diminishing our efforts? No, in fact, I'm accelerating the vaccine research efforts, at least on the part of NIAID. you know, hurry, and they say you can't hurry love, <laughs> you can't hurry fundamental basic research. You can put more resources into it, but you can't, strictly speaking, hurry it. So we're learning more and more, and at the same time, people are trying other approaches. I think even now, when we don't have all the answers, what we're learning from studying HIV is informing us in so many important ways about understanding the immune system better. I mean, we have knowledge now about the regulation of the immune system that we never would have had if we did not study HIV and it has impact on a number of other diseases. Our ability to study viral pathogenesis and viral biology of many other viruses has been greatly enhanced by the resources that we put into it. So we're already starting to see spin-offs. Uh, when we get the answers, I think it's going to open up more doors that will help us with other diseases. If we can, with our own capabilities, our intellect, our will, our drive, our resources, get to a situation where we can manipulate the immune system to do something that natural infection doesn't seem to be able to elicit it to do, what else can we do with the immune system? I mean, it's just the vista is, is, is almost in, infinite in what you can do. So I see this as science to solve an extraordinarily important pandemic that has major profound global health implications at the same time as we're furthering the knowledge of the immune system and our ability to deal with the virus immune system interaction. It's a high risk, extraordinarily high impact endeavor. If you want a guarantee, this is not for those kind of people. If you want to get involved with something that could possibly transform one of the most incredible epidemics we've ever faced, come join us.